So our topic is how divide and conquer works, how solidarity works, how competition and secrecy and fear are a very important part of how oppression continues. We're working from the worksheet uh, with the set of tasks that you had assigned. Um, and in thinking about some of the things that are shown on this worksheet, I'm hoping to have you think about how um, secrecy can play a really big role in making sure that everybody stays divided. So while our topic is how divide and conquer works, we're going to use um, classism and capitalism as an example of how um, oppression can be a big part of that system. Let me get my head on for a minute. Um, noticing a few things on this exercise. You'll notice that the names are chosen very specifically. So I'm uh, depicting the fact that we see broad patterns in which the lowest wage jobs are usually held by people of color and women. Um, and this has been proven time and again in all kinds of patterns. What I'm trying to have you think about is how that could be and or how we could change it. In thinking about how much money each person makes versus how many, or what kind of tasks they carry out, we can see that the system in itself doesn't seem to make sense because we're paying a lot of money for people who are doing pretty safe jobs in which they give out orders, they go to fancy dinners, they talk to each other. Um, and we are paying the lowest wage jobs to the people who are at highest risk, um, who have to do things that hurt their bodies like carrying weight dealing with chemicals, etc., etc. So not only do they have the worst jobs in terms of the kind of tasks they, they have to do, but they also have the worst pay for it. Another thing I'd like you to notice from the exercise is the proportion between the highest paid worker and the lowest paid worker is that it's 100 to 1. So the CEO compared to the janitor is making 100 times more. And that number is really hard to understand. $130,000 a month is something that a lot of people would have a hard time wrapping their head around. I've noticed that I tell my students and they're like, oh yeah, $130,000, whatever. And then I say, well, you notice that it's monthly, right? That it's every four weeks that this person gets $130,000 deposit into their bank account, like every 30 days, and then again in 30 days, another 130. It's such a large number that it's really hard to understand what that's like, is having $130,000 to show up in your bank account every four weeks. It's almost as if somebody was making as much as a neighborhood, right? One household versus 100 households. That somebody could make 100 times more than somebody else kind of doesn't make sense in that their job isn't 100 times more valuable or important or difficult to justify that. And I made it 100 to 1 on purpose so that the math would be easy to notice, so that people could quickly say, oh my god, that's 100 to 1. But in effect, I have actually lied in that that's not really typical CEO pay. Typical CEO pay is a lot higher, about 350 to 1 instead of 100 to 1. And so if $130,000 a month was shocking, $400,000 a month is something that's really quite inconceivable. How did we come up with a system in which we have people who don't have enough to eat, $1,300 a month, uh, versus people who make 350 times more, so a large neighborhood at that point? And we, we, we have to understand some of the dynamics that go into making this happen, but also some of the ways that we could push against it. In thinking of what would happen when folks found out that this was the setup, we might think about some of the emotions they might feel. Um, and the low and mid-level workers and the janitors might be feeling really angry and cheated. Um, and the CEOs and the VPs might have a different reaction in which they might be afraid and or worried and go, oh wow, they've found out, what do we do with this? In thinking about the best strategy for each of them, if we think about what the VPs and the CEO would like, like the best dream, like the bestest favorite thing that would happen for them would be to pretty much have no change come from this email. They would have wished that the email had never gone out, but their best scenario is to have nothing changed. So much so that they actually designed the system, right? They were the ones who chose how much everybody was going to get paid. They were the ones who knew all along how much everybody was making. So for them, the best scenario is to have nothing change, or at least as possible. So the best strategy for them would be something that would bring them almost no change. 
So, okay, maybe they have to pay a little bit more, but hopefully it should just be a very, very little bit more. So not a lot. So they might do things like um, say, well, we're going to throw them some crumbs, just very tiny crumbs, nothing big. It could be something like um, we're going to um, remodel the break room. We're going to put a microwave and a foosball table in the break room. Or we're going to have um, employee appreciation Fridays, so pizza parties on Fridays and casual Fridays. Um, we're going to um, give everybody a $1,000 bonus because we see that this is a problem. Here's a bonus or a Christmas bonus. The thing about bonuses is that it seems like it is a gift that is being very generously given. Sometimes it even comes with strings attached. Like, we're going to give a bonus to everybody who can make this much quota. So if you are in the top 50% or even the top 25% of your crew, whatever, with the output that we say, then we're going to give you a bonus. And it's perfect because now you have people competing against each other to be at that top 25%. Or it, it could be anybody who makes this much will give them a bonus. The bonuses are awesome because it lets people think that you're being generous and it was a one-time thing that was gifted to them. It's not something that they've earned, like a salary. If you make a salary increase, people start to take it for granted and assume that that is what their work is worth. And so they stop being so grateful for it. And so you don't get that praise. So when it comes to getting off cheaply and being able to give people just a little bit of money, it's better to go with bonuses than with salary increases because then you can also take them away. And in terms of money, it ends up being a lot cheaper, right? Because even a $2,000 Christmas bonus is a lot cheaper than raising everybody's wage over the whole year. So that's kind of what the VPs and CEO might have in their minds as they're trying to figure out what to do with the next steps. When it comes to the low mid-level workers and the janitors, something we got to notice is that there's a ton of them. There's 450 of them. And that number is crucial because of the strength in numbers approach. If we've said, if we've said divide and conquer works really well, unite and succeed is the way to battle that. So the fact that there's 450 of them is really important. Also, the other thing to notice is that um, they're the ones who do the really, really important work. They're the ones that make the gadgets that get sold. They're the ones that teach the classes. They're the, they're the ones that pick up the waste to keep the college running. And without them, things would fall apart really, really fast. If the supervisors didn't come in for a week, people can still kind of know what they're doing. They know how to do their work. They can continue on. Some stuff may get wonky, but not that bad. If the people who make the gadgets don't show up for a week, then we have a much bigger problem because there's no gadgets to sell and they want the money. So in uh, the low and mid-level workers and the janitor's best interest, they're needing to get focused on getting everybody together on the same page and working together to make change. So if we can get a ton of people at the lower levels to get together, they can get enough power together to push back against a power structure. So the big thing that we're looking for here is how power shifts. So if we start with the VPs and CEO, they're the ones who designed that pay scale. They knew what was happening all along. They got to make the rules, including the non-disclosure clause. They were sitting happy where they were. We have a ton of folks who have very, very little power. They don't make the decisions. They don't make the pay scale. They can't even question this non-disclosure clause. However, if you get enough of them together, because of the numbers and because of how crucial they are, they can actually band up and push back on that power and create a power shift. And this is something we're looking for is as we're trying to create that power shift, if we're not together, we can't make it happen. So it's really, really hard to get 400 people, 450 people to agree on pretty much anything. It's hard to get them to agree on strategy on what the minimum is that they'll accept, like will we be bought off with the microwave in the lunchroom, or are we going to hold off for the raise, and how long, and which ones among us are most vulnerable, who are the people who can't afford to go without a paycheck even a week, who are the people who can't afford to risk that job. Getting everybody together is going to be really difficult work, and getting everybody to agree on a strategy is going to be even more difficult. 
The thing is, it is the only way that we can shift that power imbalance. It is the only way that we can push back on the folks with lots of power who design structures and say, no, 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 the structures need to take us into account and we can't be so far from each other. Saying we need this giant gap to get a little bit smaller. Um, secrecy and fear are very wonderful tactics of divide and conquer. So for the VPs and the CEO, it makes really good sense to try to threaten people and try to break them up and say, well, um, let's buy just a few off and say, can we buy a few off with that $1,000 bonus? And there they went. And now you lost a hundred of them. Can we get rid of some of the other ones through threats and say, well, if you even think of striking, we're going to fire you. And that threat may be enough to cut out another 50 people, et cetera, et cetera. So they may try different strategies to make sure that the group falls apart. If we know that that's going to be the strategy, we can be ready for it and prepare and push back on it and say, hey, watch out because they're going to try to break us up. Now, in thinking of um, U.S. labor rights, U.S. labor rights compared to the rest of the world are pretty horrendous. Um, the U.S. is one of seven countries that doesn't have paid vacation for everybody. Um, all the other countries are very small islands with less than 100,000 people. Every other country in the world offers paid vacation to all of its workers, not just some of its workers. Um, the U.S. is one of three countries, no, one of two countries, I apologize, that does not have paid maternity leave. The other one is Papua New Guinea. Everywhere else in the world, people understand that making a human and having it come out of your body is something that people should have a little bit of time to recover from, and that having folks uh, who've just done that be in good conditions uh, will be a good thing for the entire society. It's so bad that when I teach outside of the U.S., when I teach in Colombia, when I teach in Ecuador, people don't believe me that this is the case in the U.S. They laugh and say, it cannot be. It cannot be that in the U.S. there is no paid vacation. The thing of it is that the setup in the U.S. is that there's very, very few minimums that everybody gets. There's a minimum wage, and that is really, really low. For example, did you know that the minimum wage in Texas, if you are a server, is $2, I believe, and 13 cents? Uh, because people who are in tip-making positions are told that they can make $2 an hour. And how did we come up with a system in which some humans can work this many hours and get this little for it? Part of the setup is that we have the scale in which people are taught to compete up the ladder and say, well, right now you have some pretty terrible job conditions and what you need to do is get yourself to come up higher and get yourself to come up higher. And then as you come up higher, you can have all these awesome things that the other people don't get. So as long as you're doing better, it'll be better. So don't worry about getting everybody vacation. Just make sure that you get yourself some vacation as you climb up that ladder. And we've used education as a way to justify this and say, we're going to have the worst jobs as punishment for the people who were lazy and dumb and didn't go to school. And so since they're unskilled, they don't get to have the good stuff like decent pay or vacation or uh, maternity leave. We're going to leave those as benefits, as advantages that people can compete for without recognizing that in the rest of the world, those are just the basic rules of being a worker. Like in Costa Rica, a Costa Rican janitor will have 12, paid, 12 weeks of paid maternity leave. That's the standard for everybody. Whereas in the States, to get 12 weeks of paid maternity leave, you'd likely have to be up to the CEO level. Now, when we think of it, though, um, we just offered advice to the janitors and the low and mid-level workers. So we could do something similar and say, hey, U.S. workers, you've been cheated. Somebody's been taking all the good stuff that you should be getting and not giving you any of it. And we already know that the best way to do this is to come together and push back against power. And if we can get everybody lined up and working in the same direction, we might be able to accomplish these big shifts.